speak in the beginning. You talked a little bit about um, morning versus afternoon versus late afternoon, and uh, um, how does that affect your tactics, and the, the type of, of decisions that you're making? Assuming that in the morning, if you reach an altitude and you see that you're climbing up to that altitude, then you're stopping, then you're assuming that if no one's below you signaling here, then it's probably a good idea to start looking somewhere else because that's going to be gone really soon. And maybe you need to start feeling. Yeah, in isolation, you, know, you, you go up to and you find your first thermal and you climb up and then it loses climb rate. It begs the question of, is the thermal dying or have I reached the ceiling? And so I think your question is, how do you determine whether I'm at the ceiling or the thermal's dead? Exactly. And uh, the first time you uh, climb up, you, you have to ask the question. But you can kind of feel when the thermal gets, you know, starts pushing you out. You know, just just the, like in, you know, near the ground, the thermal's evacuating you know, everything's going in. And then thermals rising up, and then when they're, that inversion is kind of like a ceiling, so that air is rising up, hits the ceiling, and spreads out. Now, to talk about it, this is more of the big picture uh, meteorology. I should probably fast forward so I can start talking about air reading. But uh, yeah, the, the temperature inversion makes that ceiling, and so you're circling along, and all of a sudden you get pushed this way, or if you're just over here, you get pushed that way. So you're at, at the top, the air is divergent. Uh, top of the thermal the air is divergent, so you're always getting pushed away, whereas near the bottom, the air is convergent. So it's easy to center up near the bottom of the thermal because it pulls you in. But, but realistically, near the ground, you, if you just circle, uh, you're either going to hit the ground or you get pulled into a thermal and you go up. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> near the top, you actually actively have to try and stay into the thermal because oh. it'll push you out. And similarly, a brand new thermal that's just starting out is coming up and, and working its way up, kind of doing the mushroom cloud thing. So the top of the thermal is always spreading. So when you're in a brand new thermal, it's really hard to stand because you go up and it pushes you out. And it's safe, you have to go find the center. So a, a brand new thermal is very difficult to stay in. Right, but uh, usually when you hit inversion, uh, it's a lot easier to to, to stay uh, to stay up because uh, first of all you, you are very high and the, the thermal is very wide it's the it's, it's widest point so it's very hard to it's very easy to stay uh, to maintain a high altitude uh, when you're near the top of the inversion what ends up happening is there's not much lift and there's not much sink. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah you don't come down as fast. But it's, it's, same token, it's hard to get up there. It's very, it's, it's very hard to, to notice any difference in height because it's usually very high. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, uh, well, uh, I remember this you know, a lot of times. Well, my, my local field is only you know, 500 meters from the ocean. And once the onshore wind starts up, the thermals get capped sometimes by 100 meters. It's like you know, my universe is from zero to 100 meters, and you try and thermal off, and it's actually that's it. And it, it's really a lot of fun because you're sitting there battling it out the, in this very small ground, <clears throat> but. Uh, it's, it's a challenge because you take that thermal and once you get within 10% to the top, it's, the thermal's actively pushing up. <coughs> and trying to stay on top of that bubble is really, really a challenge because no matter what you do, it's pushing you out and you're in, your, you're in the waterfall on either side of, on, you know, on the side of the thermal because the air is going up. <coughs> it's, uh, the lower the inversion, it, it can be very entertaining for, uh, and then air reading. It's really funny because at, when the inversion height is quite low, the rules are wrong at altitude. 
everything. When you near the top and you feel the wind drift, it's not pulling you towards a thermal, it's pushing you away from the thermal. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I mean, the, the rules are really weird. Anyhow, I talked a little bit about adiabatic and adiabatic flow. I just realized that curve started speeding up here. In this case, does this mean that, that in the morning you prefer to go fly next to the hills, avoid if I, the valley as much as possible, and at the end of the day, just try to stand in the middle of the valley and look there? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it, it's kind of cute in that uh, you know, near sunset, you can be in the valley, <coughs> and the entire valley's got 100 foot from middle lift. Just, you know, the air is flowing down the mountainsides and you know, wedging underneath the warm air in the middle of the valley, and the whole the valley just is rising. And so once you get above that shallow uh, cold air that's uh, you know, flowing in underneath, the entire valley is just slowly going up. How does that get affected if one of the slopes is towards the sun? Uh, would you then consider going? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 So you, that's the last part that, that's actually working. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The, well, it's like uh, first thing in the morning, you know, you're looking at the hill that's uh, facing the, the sun. Yeah, so that's the very first thing you start seeing. You go for the trees because they see more sun than the ground. The, the trees tend to be uh, of interest for uh, obstruction value in the morning. Uh, but trees are kind of like uh, cropland. Uh, the sun that hits them is doesn't get turned into uh, heat so much as uh, in terms of evaporation. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you guys have run into this a lot of times. What, what is important is actually how much energy is making it to the ground. And sometimes when you got high level clouds and you actually don't really realize how much that's filtering out the sun that's reaching the ground. So, this have high level haze. And, and if it's kind of uniform, you don't realize that, wow, only half the energy is making it to the ground and thermals are kind of weak. So understand what's getting filtered out. And of course, uh, <clears throat> another really important thing to pay attention to is when there's puffy cumulus clouds, where their shadows are. And one of the things I'll do when I'm flying is pay attention to, okay, over there's been in cloud shadow for 10 minutes, and over there's been in the sun for the last 10 minutes, so I'm going downwind of over there and stay away from downwind of where it's been shady for a while. So you look at the effect of the shadows of the clouds, <coughs> which is important. Another one that's uh, especially for uh, those of you who live somewhere not too far from a large body of water, uh, is the effect of uh, uh, the marine air. So at night, uh, the air on the land starts cooling down, flows out to the ocean, and in the morning, the sun comes in, starts heating up the land, the land warms up, and of course, the water is relatively constant temperature. Eventually, the air over the land warms up to be higher temperature than what's over the water, and <clears throat> And it starts pulling the air in from the uh, from from the sea, and eventually that air gets organized, so it becomes a unified body of uh, cooler air that starts walking its way inland <coughs> and uh, pushing that warmer air out, you know, out of the way. And the the uh, interface between that cooler marine layer and the warm uh, air inland becomes what they call a shear line. So. <clears throat> and they come, you know, they'll consider like the Mediterranean over here, and it starts coming in. And uh, in the you know, <clears throat> typically, what I saw yesterday and today was well, about noon, one o'clock. You start feeling the marine air coming in. You, you know, you get the established sea breeze coming in, and you'll typically find that. Uh, when it goes from no wind to, to wind, there's about 15 minutes where there's just lift everywhere. And that's when you're in this area. And then 
<clears throat> typically the, the worst time of the day is after the, the cool air comes in because the air is still warm up top but cool near the ground so the local lapse rate's horrible. So you've got a, a time where there's just not much lift and anything you find is really small and breaks up easily and then 15 minutes later now you're in established into the cooler air mass and now you now you're going back to a different uh, thermal paradigm. <coughs> now we'll get to the more fun stuff. <coughs> Rather than talking about the basic mechanics, how do you how do you use this stuff? And uh, <coughs> you know, how do you figure out where a thermal is? And the, <coughs> as I noted earlier, thermals are related to the inversion height, so. It's, a, it's good to understand what the atmosphere is doing, but uh, <clears throat> I think everybody understands you know, thermal is just air that's uh, lower density than the surrounding air, so it goes up. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff in literature about whether a thermal is a column, this donut thing, and people have written about these classic different thermal types. Well, the truth is thermals are not nearly as organized as most people think they are. It's chaotic, it's random, uh, disorganized. Uh, <clears throat> there's been some interesting stuff done in the States using laser radar to go get a velocity map of the atmosphere. And thermals are pretty disorganized. So, <clears throat> and I don't think any